hello, everybody. Please sit down. I am so happy to be here and so grateful for the wonderful uh, reception I've received here in Eldoret. Uh, this is only my second visit to Kenya, but I've been so pleased uh, to be able to come here. It's just a privilege to me. I bring you a greeting from my wife, from my family, uh, from my home congregation. And listen, I, I would love to just go on and on and tell you about the work that God's given me to do. I think a very unique ministry that God's given me. I, I can talk on and on about it. I I'm itching to get right into the, the teaching I want to do for you here this afternoon. So if you have questions about that, you could do it in our question and answer time that we're going to have in between the two sessions. Or you could just come on up and ask me personally uh, sometime here this evening. But I'm very happy to be here this, morning, this evening and then tomorrow morning as well. But this is what I want to do this evening. We're going to have two sessions in between the two sessions, a question and answer time. And what I want to do in these two teaching sessions is give you a comprehensive view of the whole story of the Bible. How does that sound? That's kind of ambitious, isn't it? Two 45-minute teachings to give you the comprehensive view of the whole story of the Bible. But I think I can do it. But, but I need to set the stage first. And let me just kind of explain what I mean. People approach the Christian life in one of two different ways. Some people think that Jesus is someone to add to their story. I'm living my life. I'm doing my thing. I have my hopes and my dreams. And you know what? If I added Jesus to my story, it would make it a lot better. And that's how a lot of people think. It's as if they're, they're uh, filming a movie. And who's the lead actor in their movie? Well, they are, of course. And they say, Jesus, I think you'd be really good in my movie. I'll even give you an important part in my movie. But I'll be the lead actor, and Jesus, you can be a character in my movie. And you're going to make my movie a lot better. There's some people who think of that way about the Christian life. But we all know, as I describe it that way, you and I, we both say, that's no way to live the Christian life. That just doesn't sound right, does it? No, no, we know that the real way to live the Christian life, that the way that Jesus spoke to us about laying down our lives for his sake and taking up our cross and following him, really translates into this kind of picture. When we come to Jesus, we come to have a part in his story. He becomes the lead actor. He becomes the most important character in our life. And anything we do, we do in support of him. Jesus' story is the greatest story of all. And what we want to do in our life is not make Jesus part of our story. We want to come in and be a part of his great story. But how do you do that? Well, what is God's great story? Well, that's what I want to talk to you about in these two sessions. And I want to begin by letting you know, of course, we're going to find the answer to these questions in the Bible. The Bible tells us in sort of this broad, comprehensive way what God's story is. So let me just give you a little basic background about the Bible. And let me, I, I want to apologize because I know that for many of you, you know this that I'm going to talk to you about. But, but I would say, I can imagine with this many people here this afternoon, that not all of you know what I'm going to be talking about here. You, you know the Bible. You, you're familiar with the Bible. But, but here's kind of an issue, is that um, you, you know the Bible in bits and pieces. You don't have an idea of the comprehensive story of the Bible. So let's talk about the Bible as all 66 books of the Bible put together. I want to talk to you about the unity of the scriptures and then the individual pieces of the Bible. You know in your Bible probably that there's a division in the Bible between Old Testament and New Testament. Now I kind of ran across a chart that I think expresses this very well. It, it organizes the books of the Bible in a way that was just sort of very striking to me. So go ahead and put up that chart that we begin with here of showing the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament books of the Bible. Now, I don't know if you've ever done chemistry or physics. You kind of recognize what the periodic table looks like. Well, I ran across a fella who organized the books of the Bible kind of like one of those charts. And over there on the left side, you see the Old Testament books. And on the right side, you see the New Testament books. And they're categorized according to groupings and according to colors in their different 
categories. So if we were to talk about the Old Testament, by the way, you could also call the Old Testament the Hebrew Scriptures, even though there's a few chapters in the Old Testament that are actually written in Aramaic, not Hebrew. It's a close language, to, but predominantly it's the Hebrew Scriptures there on the left, and on the right you have the Greek Scriptures. It's not the same as the modern Greek language, but it has a lot of similarities to it. Now, if we want to talk about the left side of the chart, the Old Testament, you can separate between the different types of literature in the Old Testament. Friends, I want you to understand that when you hold a Bible in your hand, you're not just holding a book, you're holding a library. You're holding 66 books that are arranged together and have different um, approaches, different, different messages that they communicate. But for example, the first Many books of the Bible are historical in nature. Those ones that you see right there with the yellow uh, uh, border around them. Those are the historical books of the Bible, beginning with the book of Genesis and ending with the book of Esther. That's the first grouping, the historical books. Then you have a section of poetic or wisdom literature there in the morning, in the middle, starting with the book of Job and including uh, Proverbs, uh, Psalms, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. Then third, you have the prophetic books. And first you have what they call the major prophets. Those are the longer books, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel's thrown in there as well. And then you have the smaller books that they call the minor prophets. That's sort of the arrangement of the books of the Old Testament. Now, if we're just going to talk about the Old Testament, let me just give you a very quick, brief summary of the flow of history from Genesis all the way through to the book of Malachi. If you were to divide the flow of history through the Old Testament, you would begin with two parts of the story in the book of Genesis. I'll explain what you mean. In the book of Genesis, you have, first of all, what I would call the prologue or the very beginning of the story. And what is the beginning of the story? Well, that's in Genesis chapter 1 through 11. The creation, the fall, the flood, the dividing of the nations, all the way up to Genesis chapter 11. But then starting at Genesis chapter 12, you have something else entirely. Starting from Genesis chapter 12, all the way through to the book of the end of the book of Revelation, you have a different story altogether. You have God's working, but you have the beginnings, then you have the patriarchs, that's Genesis chapter 12 through, verse 50, through chapter 50. Then you have the whole section of Egypt and the Exodus. Those are the books from Exodus to Deuteronomy. Then you have the period of Joshua and the judges, Joshua, Judges, Ruth. Then you have the period of the rise and fall of Israel's kingdoms. That takes you all the way from 1 Samuel all the way through to the book of Esther. And then at the end of that, historically speaking, you have about 400 years of silence until the New Testament begins. So those are just simple groupings. The very beginnings, Genesis chapter 1 through 11. Then the patriarchs, Genesis chapter 12 through 50. Then you have the Egypt and the Exodus. That's the rest of the books of Moses. Then you have the coming into the promised land before there was a monarchy. And finally, you have the rise and the fall of Israel's kingdoms. Now, if you want to sort of organize the New Testament, you come over to the right side of the chart. First of all, you could sort of tell the story of the New Testament. We organize the New Testament like this. You have the historic books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then John is sort of his own category. But then you have the book of Acts, which is the history of God's work through the earliest Christians. Those are the books that tell the story of what God was doing in the early church. But then you have the books that were written to help those first century Christians. And those are the letters, the letters that begin with the letters of Paul, starting with Romans, and then go all the way through to the letter that Paul wrote to Philemon. Those are Paul's letters. And then what you also have is a category that we call the general letters. That is letters written by other uh, authors of the New Testament, yet these letters, starting with the book of Hebrews and going all the way through 3rd John and Jude, those letters weren't written to specific congregations, but just to Christians in general. 
And then finally, you have after the story, after the letters, then you have the book of Revelation, which is all about finding hope and guidance for the future. Now, what's very interesting is that when you think about the Old Testament, the Old Testament covers history from the very beginning of creation. Somewhere about uh, the very beginning of creation right there is when it starts in Genesis chapter 1. And then it continues all the way to about 400 BC. That's the span of the Old Testament. That's a long time. That's thousands of years. But do you understand the New Testament, the historical timeline for the New Testament is a little bit less than 100 years. Old Testament, thousands of years. New Testament, just less than 100 years. And and what's sort of the timeline of the New Testament? Well, the New Testament begins with the events that surrounded the birth of John the Baptist. Then it continues with the events surrounding the birth of Jesus Christ. Then there's a few mentions of the boyhood of Jesus. We always wish there were more mentions of the childhood of Jesus. You know, it sort of drove some early Christians a little bit crazy that he didn't say more about the childhood of Jesus, so they started making up stories. And we, we have books that were written three, four, five hundred years after the time of Jesus where people just made up stories about the birth of, or not just the birth, but the boyhood of Jesus. The, the actual scriptures only give us a little bit of information. Then Jesus, as about a 30-year-old man, began his ministry. That ministry lasted about three years. And what did Jesus do during those three years? Well, he taught and he trained his disciples. He taught the multitudes. He taught them about his kingdom. And then Jesus healed the sick. He raised the dead. He showed his authority over creation. Jesus both confronted and he exposed religious corruption. That was a big part of his ministry. But Jesus' most important work was none of those things. His most important work was his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And then 40 days after his resurrection, Jesus ascended to heaven. After Jesus ascended to heaven, the trained disciples of Jesus were left behind to carry on his work. And once they were filled with the Holy Spirit, then the number of the disciples began to multiply exponentially, even though at times they suffered severe persecution. And the rest of the New Testament tells the story of the progress and the multiplication of Jesus' disciples, all the time giving the wisdom and guidance that these early Christians needed. Now, During the days of Jesus' earthly ministry, he spoke a lot about his second coming and the events surrounding his return. So the book of Revelation fulfills that story at the very end. But make no uh, um, mistake about it. If you're talking about the story of the Bible, just sort of in that quick overview we've given, there's a focus to the story. And the focus of the story of the Bible is Jesus Christ himself. You know, you could say, I think accurately so, that Jesus is presented in every single book of the Bible. I kind of made up a list some time ago. So if you're okay with this, it's a long list for me. There's 66 books in the Bible. I'm going to read through the list of the 66 books of the Bible and just mention one way, I'm sure we could come up with many more if we took the time to do it, but one way that Jesus is presented in every one of the books of the Bible. Are you ready? Let's begin with this. In Genesis, Jesus is the promised Savior, the seed of the woman. In Exodus, he's the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, he's the perfect sacrifice. In Numbers, he's the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. In Deuteronomy, he's the prophet like unto Moses. In Joshua, he's the commander of the Lord's army. In Judges, he is our deliverer. In Ruth, he's our kingsman redeemer. In 1 Samuel, he's the ultimate prophet, priest, and king. In 2 Samuel, he's the son of David. In 1 Kings, he's wiser than Solomon and the builder of God's ultimate temple. In 2 Kings, he's the prophet greater than Elijah or Elisha. In 1 Chronicles, he's David's ultimate royal descendant. 
In 2 Chronicles, he's our reigning king. In Ezra, he's the priest who proclaims freedom. In Nehemiah, he's the rebuilder of everything broken. In Esther, he's the morning star, the protector of his people. In Job, he's our ever-living redeemer. In Psalms, he's our shepherd. In Proverbs, he's our wisdom. In Ecclesiastes, he's our meaning for life. In the Song of Solomon, he's the loving bridegroom. In Isaiah, he's the suffering servant. In Jeremiah, he's the prophet warning and weeping over coming judgment. In Lamentations, he bears God's wrath with his people. In Ezekiel, he is the glorious Lord. In Daniel, he's the fourth man in the fiery furnace with his people. In Hosea, he's the faithful husband. In Joel, he's the outpourer of the Holy Spirit. In Amos, he brings justice to the oppressed. In Obadiah, he's the judge of those who afflict God's people. In Jonah, Jesus is the greatest missionary. In Micah, Jesus is the ruler of the world from Bethlehem. In Nahum, he's our stronghold. In Habakkuk, Jesus is the watchman. In Zephaniah, he's the mighty one who saves. In Haggai, he's the desire of nations. In Zechariah, he's the one who's pierced. In Malachi, he's the son of righteousness with healing in his wings. Hold on, I got to take a drink of water after that. Can we just pause for a moment between Old and New Testament? All right, shall we continue? In Matthew, he's the Messiah who's the king of the Jews. In Mark, Jesus is the Messiah who's the servant. In Luke, he's the Messiah who's the son of man. In John, he's the Messiah who's the son of God. In Acts, he's the ascended Lord of his church. In Romans, he's the righteousness of God. In 1 Corinthians, he's the wisdom and power of God. In 2 Corinthians, he is strength perfected in weakness. In Galatians, Jesus is our liberty. In Ephesians, Jesus is the head of the church. In Philippians, he's the bond servant who laid aside his rights and privileges. In Colossians, Jesus is the creator and preeminent over all things. In 1 Thessalonians, he's our comfort in the last days. In 2 Thessalonians, he's our returning king. In 1 Timothy, he's the savior of the worst sinners. In 2 Timothy, he's the one mediator between God and man. In Philemon, he's our benefactor. In Titus, he's the blessed hope. In Hebrews, Jesus is our perfect and sympathetic high priest. In James, he's the Lord of glory and the source of living faith. In 1 Peter, he's our chief shepherd. In 2 Peter, he's the beloved son. In 1 John, he's the source of all fellowship with God. In 2 John, he is God come in the flesh. In 3 John, he's the source of all truth. In Jude, he's the one able to keep us from falling. And in Revelation, he's the king of kings and lord of lords, alpha and omega, beginning and the end, the conquering king and the one who makes all things new. Friends, isn't that a glorious list? Now, you got to say, that's the best story ever. You can't come up with a better story than this. But this is what I want you to understand. I'm sure if I spoke to each one of you individually, you know some great stories from the Bible. You, You know about, well, what are good Bible stories people know? Noah and the ark. Gideon's unlikely victory. David and Goliath, Elijah and the prophets of Baal, Daniel in the lion's den, the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem, the healing of the man at the pool of Bethesda, and the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Every one of those is a great story that we should pay attention to. But, but, many people don't realize that there's an overarching story that goes from Genesis to Revelation. It's God's big story, his story as a whole. And I want you to know, God's big story is greater than anything anyone could imagine. It's the greatest of stories, but I want you to know this, it's more than a story. Because this story impacts everything. Please listen, every man, Every woman, every child who has ever existed has some place in this story. All of creation has some place in this story. 
The the story we're going to look at both now and in our second session, it's the story of all times. It comprehends everything in the past, in the present, and it extends into the future. It's a story of a place. Do, Do you realize of everything that happens in the Bible, almost all of it, not all, but almost all of it happens in the land that we call today Israel. Friends, Israel's not that big of a land, but almost all of what happens in the Bible happens in that particular place. It's also the story of a people. Now, I want you to understand, the story touches all people throughout all ages, but the story in the Old Testament focuses on the Jewish people, and the story in the New Testament focuses on the church. But most importantly, this is the story, as I said, of Jesus Christ. It's the story of a person. He is the leading man of the whole story. As I said before, in some way, every single book of the Bible points to Jesus. You could say that Jesus Christ is the point of the whole story. Now, to give that idea some emphasis, I want you to turn in your Bibles now to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. I hope you brought a Bible. I hope you look at a Bible. I I hope that if you don't have one in front, you can look over at your neighbor. Because you know what? When a pastor or somebody like me comes and speaks before a congregation, you want to follow what they say and make sure it's actually coming from the words that are in your Bible. And I know that oftentimes they'll put the Bible words up on the screen as well, but maybe you want to check that as well and make sure it's right there as what you have in the book. Okay, so Ephesians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, I find these two verses so fascinating. Let's walk through them together here. Having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to the good pleasure which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, in him. Friends, I think if we walk through those two verses very carefully, we're gonna see how in an amazing way they emphasize the fact that the whole story of the Bible focuses upon Jesus Christ. The whole story of God's work in the ages focuses on Jesus Christ. Let's walk through it piece by piece. Starting again at verse nine, let's just phrase by phrase. Having made known to us the mystery of his will. Okay, having been made known to us. What do you think the us is that Paul's talking about? Well, maybe somebody could just say, well, it was the people Paul was writing to, the Ephesians. But but listen, I I think almost everybody would agree that he's talking about Christians, God's family, not just the particular people in Ephesus, but, but all of God's family throughout all generations. When he says, having been made known to us, he's talking about you. God has made something known to you, so let's pay attention to it right now. Having been made known to us the mystery of his will. God has given us some knowledge here. It's knowledge of the mystery of his will. Now, now when I say that, some of you go, ooh, mystery of his will. This must be way out there. It must be mystery. It must be some mystical thing. Now, I, I need to explain something to you about what we mean when the Bible says mystery. It's sort of in the definition of the ancient word that we translate mystery. You see, for us, a mystery is something that you don't know. Uh, Who spilled the coffee? Nobody knows. It's a mystery. And you would say, well, if I found out who, who spilled the coffee, then it wouldn't be a mystery anymore. Okay, that's not exactly how the ancient Greek word mysterion We just sort of transfer that word over into English. It's not how the ancient Greek word mysterion really has its definition and and sense. The the word mystery in the Bible, in the New Testament, this is kind of how it means. It's something you couldn't know unless someone revealed it to you. 
You see, you can know a mystery in the Bible, and it's still a mystery. It's just you would have never known it unless somebody revealed it. You would have never figured it out yourself. It had to be revealed to you. And that's what we're talking about. We're talking about something here that nobody could have ever figured out unless God revealed it. And he has revealed to it. That's what it says right there. Having made known to us the mystery of his will, that according to his good pleasure, what we're talking about here is something that pleased God to do. According to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, God said, I'm going to do this because I want to do this. It's going to glorify me. It's going to be, it's going to be exalting in all the best way throughout all the universe, which he purposed in himself that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, what's a dispensation? It's a word that's a little hard to get a hold of that idea, but basically it's a plan. It's a strategy. You could translate it this, that in the plan or the strategy, in the fullness of times, God's going to do something. He's got an idea. He's got a plan. What is God going to do? Check it out. This is in verse 10. You ready for this? This is what God's going to do. This is what he's revealed to us by the mystery of his will. Verse 10, that he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. Dear brothers and sisters, let me tell you something. God's ultimate plan is to bring together to sum up, to resolve everything in Jesus Christ. At the end of it all, when Jesus Christ is returned in glory, when all of humanity has stood before God in judgment, when everything is resolved by God's perfect justice, then everything will be resolved in Christ either with Jesus Christ as the King of heaven or Jesus Christ as the Lord over hell. Everything will be resolved in him. And when will this happen? In the fullness of the times. That's the phrase that he uses there in verse 9. I want you to go back here to verse 10 and take a look at something. He uses a phrase that he might gather together in one... All things in Christ. You see, that word that's translated gather together really has the idea of uniting something or summing something up. In the ancient world, they would use it when they were doing maths. They would write out the figures and at the bottom they would say, I'm going to gather together the answer. This is going to sum up everything. That's the same word that Paul uses, that Jesus is the summation, the gathering together. If I could say he is the resolution of all things. Friends, do you see what I mean when I say that Jesus Christ is the subject of the whole overarching story in the Bible? Everything is gathered together in him. Here's the picture that I have in mind. If I was smarter, I would have had a beautiful graphic for you there to look at on the screen. But you can picture this in your mind. Picture a huge chalkboard. I don't know if people use chalkboard anymore. Everybody uses a whiteboard or a video screen. But you know what a chalkboard is? It's a huge chalkboard, a big one. And picture a... A scientist there in a white lab coat there at that chalkboard and he has a big piece of chalk in his hand. And he's a brilliant scientist. And what he starts doing is he starts marking down a scientific equation, some mathematical calculation. And he's making marks and marks and you look at it 
And I don't know, maybe there's a mathematician here, but I'm not a mathematician. I don't know hardly anything about math. I would look at it and I would say, I don't understand that at all. But he's a brilliant mathematician and he's writing out the problem. And this is what he's doing. He's writing out the problem, the issue in all the universe. And he writes a line and he writes another line And he writes another line. And he's maybe down about a third way through the blackboard. And he's starting to write. And then he stops right there. And you know what he does? He's a brilliant scientist. He's a brilliant mathematician. So he knows the answer even before he finishes writing out the equation. So what does he do? He stops in the middle. He goes down to the very bottom of the uh, the chalkboard. And he writes out the answer. And then he goes up and he keeps writing out the equation. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that's what God has done for us. He started writing out the issue, the problem, the scenario, the plan. And then partway through writing it all out, he paused and he said, I want everybody to know the answer to the issue. It's Jesus Christ. Now, my... My stated goal for this teaching and the one that's going to follow after our question and answer time. My my stated goal is to give you a comprehensive view of the Bible. So that you can make some sense of it from Genesis to, to Revelation. That it's not just a collection of Bible stories or fortune cookies or something like that. That's my stated goal. But I want you to know something. I'm particularly burdened that you understand that Jesus Christ is the answer. That all things are summed up in him. There's a section in the letter to the Hebrews where he starts talking about the difficulties that believers face because the letter to the Hebrews was written to suffering Christians, Christians who were really going through it. And in this section of the letter to the Hebrews, he's essentially saying, you know, we have this difficulty, we have that difficulty, we don't know, we don't understand a lot of things. And then he stops and he says, but we see Jesus. Brothers and sisters, I'm here to tell you that the answer is Jesus. Now, I don't mean that in a superstitious way. There are people who take actual biblical truths and they twist them, they contort them, and they make superstitious ceremonies about them. So I'm not talking about using the name of Jesus as an incantation. I'm not talking about some strange idea that that, that Jesus uh, makes everything um, rich and healthy and prosperous and easy in your life. No, no, no. What I'm saying is that the answer to your problem and the problem of all humanity is found in Jesus Christ, the Son of Man who came and walked this earth. And the highest aspiration of life should be for us to know Jesus better and for us to truly follow him as disciples. As people that just did, as they did in the days of the books, of the the gospels, the gospel accounts, that we would follow Jesus and be his servants. What Paul told us so plainly in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, that there will be a great resolution and deliverance for all things. I love what Paul wrote in the book of Romans. He said that even creation longs for this deliverance. It's as if creation is groaning, waiting for this great deliverance, for everything to be added up, to being resolved in Jesus Christ. And I'll tell you that in some sense, even though God's given us the answer, he's still writing the problem on the chalkboard. And even if you don't completely understand the problem, you can know the answer. The answer is Jesus Christ. Creation groans for that resolution of all things. Friends, there is a day when every wrong will be righted, 
when every matter will be resolved according to God's holy love and his justice, and I'm here to tell you that it will happen. God will resolve all things in Jesus Christ. And as I said to you before, the end of the story is already written. But if you just want to imagine one more time in your mind that blackboard that I asked you to picture, you, you and I and every one of us here, we're a mark on that blackboard. We have a place, a role in God's unfolding plan of the ages. And I'm going to admit, the role that I have, the role that you have, in that great plan that God is working out, in this great thing that he's doing in all the universe, your role, my role, any individual's role, it's, it's small. If it was a movie, maybe we would just be a face in the crowd. Maybe we'd have the smallest thing where we just say one or two words. But listen, I'd rather have a small role in the greatest production that the universe has ever seen than have the leading role in my own sorry life. I want the smallest of roles in God's unfolding plan of the ages. And God invites me, he invites you to say, lay down the story of your own life. Stop trying to make it all about you. Listen, if you came to Jesus because you thought he, he would, uh, he, he, he'd give you just all the things you wanted and make your life better, listen, I, I don't know the circumstances behind that, but it's not right. Maybe somebody misrepresented the Christian life to you in a wrong way. Maybe that understanding just came to you in a different way, but that's not right. No, we come to Jesus and we say, I surrender to you completely. And I want the smallest role in your great plan of the ages. And Jesus says, come along. You, you've got your role, and your role is important. Now, let me give just a brief introduction to what we're going to do in the second part, after we have our question and answer time. The end of the story is already written, but if you want to look at the entire story, if the Bible is one entire story, you could organize it into five parts. Here's the five parts of the Bible story, and that's what we're going to talk about. Understanding that it all points to Jesus Christ. We've made that clear, haven't we? But in our next session, we're going to talk about these five parts of the Bible story. Number one, we have the prelude. That's eternity past. Number two, we have the introduction. That's Genesis chapters one and two. And then we have act one. That's the fall and continuing fall of humanity. Then we have act two, God's drama of redemption. That's Genesis 12 through Revelation chapter 19. And then you have the postscript, the resolution of all things. We're gonna talk about that in our second session, but I hope you can catch the passion that I have for communicating this to you. Let, let's lay aside this thought of trying to make Jesus do what we want him to do and instead come to Jesus humbly and say, I'll take whatever role you have for me in your great plan of the ages. Father, that's our prayer. And we pray, Lord God, that to whatever extent we want to make it about us, that you would root that out of us and drive us to doing what you do, what the Bible does, what all creation does, and make it all about Jesus. We've come here to be your disciples, Jesus, to follow you. Help us along those lines, we pray, in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Amen. Amen.